Hi students, welcome back. I hope you had a nice break and today we are going to get into chapter six of your text. And chapter six deals a lot with transportation and transportation in and out of California and how that impacts the history of the state. Uh, we're going to talk about the original transportation systems a little bit in and out of the state and then we're going to move on to talk about the transcontinental railroad. The gold rush and the transcontinental railroad uh, brought over uh, thousands of Chinese workers and so we're going to talk about um, the Chinese in California, their contribution to the landscape and development of California and then ultimately sort of the way in which Californians and others um, start to discriminate against the Chinese um, ending our lecture today with the Chinese Exclusion Act. So let's go ahead and get started. So you can see here, I've kind of interspersed this lecture today with some local history. These are things that you won't find in your textbook, but that I still like to talk about in terms of um, our history here in the Valley. We're gonna talk about the stagecoach and the railroad and how critical it is to the development of the Coachella Valley. Okay, so we're gonna begin by talking about transportation in and out of California before the railroads, before the railroads. And before California even became a state, we have the wagon trains that would cross over the Sierra Nevada during the summer. And one of the main wagon train operators was Russell's, Majors, and Waddell. And they would travel from Salt Lake City to California in these big oxen wagon train um, uh, caravans. And again, um, the problem was it was very slow, it was inefficient, they would break down frequently, um, and they were only able to travel in the summer. When California became a state, it became clear to Congress and people along the East Coast that there would have to be an effective way to get mail to California. So Congress offers a subsidy to any company who can deliver the mail from the Mississippi River to San Francisco in 25 days or less. And it was the Butterfield Stagecoach Company, also sometimes referred to as the Butterfield Overland Mail Company, which got this congressional contract in order to operate the mail between the East and California. So the way that it would work is you would have a stagecoach. That stagecoach would have about nine passengers and it would also carry with it bags of mail. It could get from the Mississippi River to California in three weeks, taking the southern route. And the reason why it took the southern route, of course, is so that it could travel even during the winter. But again, it had the problem of the wagon trains and that it was slow, it broke down often, and it had to make frequent stops because of passengers. So then you have the Pony Express and the Butterfield uh, Stagecoach Mail uh, route opened up in 1858. Two years later, the Pony Express will open up service. And the Pony Express was a very fast system. It could get mail from San Francisco to St. Joseph, Missouri in just 10 days. And the way that it worked was using a relay system. So you had these horses and single riders and the rider would get on the horse and the horse would be changed every 10 miles and then the rider would change every 70 miles so that neither the rider nor the horse ever became fatigued. So it was this constant re relay system. It was very effective, but it lasted only 18 months because it was soon replaced by the telegraph lines, which get laid to California in 1861. So that will eventually put the Pony Express out of service because then telegraph messages could get sent, of course, much quicker than the Pony Express riders could ride. So those were the overland options. If you wanted to get to California through overland options, you would either take the wagon trains, which again were only during the summer, or you could get on the stagecoach and take the, uh, the ride with the Butterfield stagecoach, which also carried the mail. There was a second option to get over to California, and that was through the shipping routes. 
and there were two different options here. You could go around Cape Horn, the bottom of South America. That would take about 130 days or so. Um, and then if you wanted to take a different route, you could take, if you wanted to risk going through the Panamanian Isthmus, which you always risk, of course, getting diseases or anything could happen on that journey, you could take a boat to the Panamanian Isthmus, get on a rickety old uh, railway, which would take you across the Isthmus and then board another boat. And that would take about a month. So, you know, it was either 130 days around the bottom of South America, or you could take a month going through the Isthmus. So the most um, common way that people came to California prior to the advent of the railway was overland. Um, and then if you could afford to do it, you might also take a boat. So all people agreed, um, all Americans agreed that you know, building a railway to California was a great idea. It was just simply, how was this going to be done? That was the question. So speaking of the stagecoach, um, the stagecoach, including the Butterfield route, came through the Coachella Valley. And um, the Agua Caliente actually had contact with them um, as they were coming through. And this was the first major contact that local native people had with uh, Americans was through this stagecoach route that went through the valley. Now, contact with um, Europeans dated back to 1774 when the De Anza expedition came through the valley. You'll remember from when we were talking about native uh, people in California, the De Anza expedition was during the Spanish period where they were trying to send colonies of people, women and children included, um, into California to settle in the Pueblos. And so that was in 1774, the De Anza expedition came through and that was the first sort of known contact between um, the Agua Caliente and the local Cahuilla tribes and uh, Europeans. Um, in 1853, fast forwarding quite significantly into the American period, um, the United States government sends a survey team to map the area around Palm Springs. Um, and this was for the purpose of potential railroad lines and also just for travel routes generally. This is also the same time that surveyors noticed that there was a potential for agriculture to develop in this region. Um, because it was uh, noted in the surveyor's logs that there was a very shallow groundwater here and that, of course, there was lots of sun. So um, it was noted. And so that, that was sort of the beginning, the seed for what will later on become the Imperial Valley and the agricultural industry here. So that happens in 1853. And then in 1863, the Butterfield Stagecoach Line um, comes through the valley and is established through the San Gregorio Pass. And this was really the best route um, across um, these desert areas in terms of accessibility. Of course, in the summertime, it would have been very hot and uncomfortable, um, but Banning was a major um, stopover um, on the stagecoach route, route. So it would go through Yuma, Arizona, cross the Colorado River, and then up through the Imperial Valley and through the San Gregorio Pass to uh, Los Angeles. So um, unfortunately with the stagecoach and the fact that so many people were coming through, um, the Agua Caliente are going to be exposed to smallpox and there's gonna be a big smallpox outbreak um, amongst the Cahuilla in 1863, which will kill a significant number of Cahuilla uh, in Indian, sadly. Um, but the stagecoach is really critical for um, the development of the valley because as people were coming through, they were noting the landscape, um, they were noting the geography, the resources, and that will later on lead to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, the southern um, portion of the San Transcontinental Railroad um, through the Coachella Valley as well, which will really bring um, people and industry.
Okay, so the push for the Transcontinental Railroad dates all the way back to the 1840s. So it actually predates um, the, uh, the entrance of California into the United States. And it was Asa Whitney who um, encourages the building of this railway to connect the West Coast to the rest of the United States um, for trade with Asia. And he was a big um, trader. He did a lot of trading with China. And so he had his own sort of personal interest in this. But he began the process of planting the seeds in politicians' minds about building this transcontinental line. Another big promoter of uh, the transcontinental line was a senator by the name of Thomas Hart Benton. This was also John C. Fremont's wife's father. Um, just a little interesting side note. And he promoted this as a, um, he envisioned this as being a connection with Europe as America being sort of the middleman between Europe and Asia, right? Sort of this Colombian idea of connecting um, Europe with Asia via the Americas. Um, and then finally, Secretary of State William Seward, who was the Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln, saw building the Transcontinental Railway as a way for the United States to become this big global superpower, right? And understanding not just the strategicness of, um, for commerce, but also military, et cetera. So, there was a big problem, however, prior to the Civil War, and that's that the Southerners were really adamant in not wanting the North to have the first transcontinental line. They already felt like the North had more of an advantage economically. Most of the banks were located in the Northern states, um, and so they were very much opposed to it. And every time a vote or committees began to talk about it in the, in the Congress, um, it got voted down by the Southern delegates. But when the Civil War broke out in 1861 and those Southern states seceded, that left the Congress open to voting on it once again without those Southern delegates. And so that will really be what gets the law passed, which will form the basis of the building of the first Transcontinental Railroad, the Pacific Railroad Act. So the work in the dream of Asa Whitney was really carried out by a very young engineer by the name of Theodore Judah. And by young, I mean about 28 years old. When he starts to think about and almost get obsessed with this idea of mapping a route through the Sierra Nevada mountains in order for a railroad to go through. And he, he found one. He found one over Donner Pass, which he found that the grade would work for a railroad line, right? You need to have a gradual enough grade um, in each direction in order for a railroad to be able to be safely built and so that the railroad, you know, doesn't go down the hill too fast. And so he, he was able to find a way across the Sierra Nevada. And he does this when he's very young and he was able to um, secure funding to form the Central Pacific Company of California. And he does this by reaching out to some um, investors, some merchants um, living in Sacramento at the time, known as the Big Four. So here are images of the Big Four, also sometimes referred to as the Associates. They are Charles Crocker, Mark Hopkins, Collis Huntington, and Leland Stanford. All of them came to California to seek their fortune in the gold rush, um, either through mining or through merchant work. In fact, most of them ended up making the majority of their money um, through being merchants in the Sacramento area. And they had enough capital, um, just barely, um, to invest and to incorporate um, the Central Pacific Company. 
and Judah is the one that reaches out to these guys and so he convinces them to invest in this company and also convinces them to travel to Washington DC with him to try to secure and try to try to work out a deal with the government which eventually will become the Pacific Railroad Act and to secure their um, part of the contract to build the first transcontinental line. Um, and really Judah is helping them out immensely here because he is the engineer that was able to map out this route that was doable through the Sierra Nevada. So that was really the first step. Um, without Judah, they would not have been successful at selling their pitch to the United States Congress. So they traveled to Washington. Um, they've established the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Um, Leland Stanford is set as the president. Huntington is the vice president. Crocker as the construction um, and financing, financing for construction and labor uh, manager. Hopkins is the treasurer and Judah is the chief engineer. Um, they travel to Washington. They help negotiate the Pacific Railroad Act and they can, are able to secure a contract for the Central Pacific to build the western half of the first transcontinental railroad. At the time, Abraham Lincoln is president. Um, he signs the Pacific Railroad Act into law in 1862. Um, very quickly, there starts to be some tension between Judah and especially Crocker, who was in charge of construction and labor. And relationships start to kind of um, fall apart between these two. Um, and eventually, tragically, uh, Judah will um, leave California to go back to uh, the East Coast and on his way across the Panamanian Isthmus, he gets very ill and ends up dying. So very quickly, he kind of drops out of the picture and um, soon it will just be the big four left with building this transcontinental railroad. So let's now turn to talking about what are the provisions of the Pacific Railroad Act. Okay, so the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862, basically the primary thing is it ensures financial support from Congress, and that included, of course, the giving of land to the railroad companies so that they could build their railroad across this surveyed government land. The first two railroad companies to get contracts with the government for building the Transcontinental Railroad are the Central Pacific, which will build the line from California eastward, and the Union Pacific, who will build their line from Nebraska westward. Okay, along with the Pacific Railroad Act, of course, comes all of these provisions and land grants. Um, the government, of course, owned the land, but essentially agreed to grant a 200-foot right-of-way for the railroad companies so that they could build their tracks across this federal land. The federal government also agreed to provide funding for certain amount of stations and other buildings, such as water towers, which are essential, of course, if you're going to be operating a steam locomotive. Um, there was also a subsidy, um, a land subsidy, that was given out um, where the railroad would be granted every other square mile of land on both sides of the track up to 20 miles in either direction. At first it was 10 miles, but then it got increased to 20 miles in either direction. So this was significant, right? Because now you have um, the government who uh, uh, owns every other square mile and then the railroad companies who own every other square mile for 20 miles out in either direction on each side of the track. So that if towns are established along those railway lines, which of course they would be, um, then the railroad
companies could sell parcels of that land and again increase their profits. The same with the government, of course, they could sell parcels of their land as well. So it was kind of this mutually uh, beneficial agreement. And then to kind of sweeten the pot here, the government decides to um, offer the railroad company 30-year bonds uh, with the 6% interest, by the way, which is significant, for every mile of track completed. So it was $16,000 per mile for easy grades, $32,000 per mile for high plains, and $48,000 per mile for the mountainous sections. So this was a way for the government to compensate the railroad companies for putting out the capital to build the railroad. Okay, so let's look at this um, kind of blurry, and I apologize for that, but it gives you a sense of um, the way that this works. So this says right away 100 yards wide. Um, they're measuring in yards instead of feet. But anyway, so you've got this right away here. This would be where the tracks would be laid. And then you can see that the land grants are checkerboard pattern. So you have one checkerboard going to the railroad, one to the government, one to the railroad, and so on and so forth. And this would allow for, again, both the government and the railroad companies to be able to uh, benefit significantly from either leasing or selling that land on either side of the tracks. Okay, so there was a serious issue with getting workers to build the railroad for the Central Pacific. Um, on the side, on the Union Pacific side, the side that was building from Nebraska westward, they didn't have that much of a problem. There were a lot of immigrant populations, particularly Irish immigrants that were willing to work. Um, after the Civil War, there were a lot of African Americans that went to work on uh, the railroad. But for the Central Pacific, it was very difficult to get workers because most people in California were not interested in building a railroad through the mountainous regions of the Sierra Nevada. It was very difficult work. The Sierra Nevada is full of these granite mountains and these obstacles. And so um, most uh, workers available in the, in the state at the time were not interested. In fact, when a call went out for workers, only about 800 uh, people responded to the call. And so Charles Crocker um, decides that he is going to try to employ Chinese workers to work on the railroad. Now, Chinese already lived in California because many Chinese people had come to California for the gold rush. And some of them didn't necessarily come to get rich. Some of them were actually fleeing, you know, um, real dangerous situations in China with the Opium Wars, which happened back in the 1850s um, and 1860s in China. So um, they were, you know, they were here and they were available. They were small and able-bodied, strong, and um, they were known for their hard work, and they were also willing to work for less um, than the Anglo uh, um, uh, settlers were. So um, the Central Pacific decided to take a chance with Chinese workers, and they did sort of an experiment, and that experiment was very successful. And so they started hiring more and more Chinese workers, and pretty soon they had a, a, a crew of about 12,000 Chinese workers working on the railroad. The majority of the workers on the railroad for the Central Pacific were Chinese, and they were able to do remarkable things as they built their way through the railroad through the Sierra Nevada. Um, an example is, um, you know, you have to do these very like quick maneuvers with the uh, dynamite blast because you need to be able to put the dynamite into the rock and then scurry away as quick as possible. And in some cases, Chinese 
men were lowered down onto ropes on the side of these cliffs, having to drill holes into the side of the cliff, put the dynamite in, light the fuse, and then get pulled up as quickly as possible away from the blast. As you can imagine, there were a lot of fatalities and injuries as a result of this very dangerous uh, work. It was also very tedious because it was slow. It was very slow moving um, through the Sierra Nevada. And for many, many years, um, Chinese workers really did not get acknowledged um, for their work on the Central Pacific and the First Transcontinental Railroad. In fact, it was quite the opposite. In fact, Chinese people were um, uh, persecuted and um, there were discriminatory laws um, made against them, which we will talk about later in this um, in this lecture. But if you click on this link right here, um, it will tell you about how um, Chinese workers on the Transcontinental Railroad are now starting to get more recognition. And this is a story of how um, currently people are working to create a monument um, to Chinese laborers up at Donner Pass so that they could be uh, remembered. So um, both the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, they're working, they're competing for these federal substance subsidies. Um, they want to build as many lines as they pos or as much uh, uh, um, track as they possibly can in order to gain those subsidies, those bonds. Um, and the Central Pacific decides to make a big push once it gets over the Sierra Nevada and down into um, the flat you know, deserts of Nevada and Utah, um, they decide to uh, hold a competition between themselves and the Union Pacific, and they won. They were able to lay, lay um, 10 miles of track in one day, so that was the record. The transcontinental line was connected in an elaborate ceremony, May 10th, 1869, Promontory Summit, Utah, Telegraphs were sent out across the country. There were parades in the streets in San Francisco, in Sacramento, Chicago, New York. The country was now connected with this um, communication transportation network um, that would quicken the ability of people to conduct business and, of course, for people to get from point A to point B. An example is if you were to leave New York um, before the building of the transcontinental line, let's say there was no train out of New York, and get over to California, it would have taken you probably four months um, over land, and that's if you were lucky. And of course, you would have to make that journey um, in the summer. Um, and now you could get on a train in New York, get to San Francisco, in four days. So it was a huge, huge um, revolution when it comes to compressing time and space. So here you have an image of some of the Chinese workers that worked on the Central Pacific um, building the railroad, again, with very little recognition. And this is a photograph, a staged photograph of the connecting of the Central and Union Pacific uh, lines there at Promontory Point in Utah. And you can see very prominently missing from this image are the workers and specifically the Chinese workers of which there were 10,000 present um, at the time uh, were missing from this photograph. All right, so with the Big Four's huge success with the building of the first transcontinental railroad, um, in 1865, they decide to form a second railroad company, the Southern Pacific Railroad, which will later on become a holding company in 1886. But it first gets its charter in 1865. With the completion of the um, Transcontinental Railroad, it will eventually absorb the Central Pacific Railroad. In 1866, the Congress will give Southern Pacific Railroad 
a huge land grant um, in the state of California that included large areas in the San Joaquin Valley. So not only this isn't just um, right of ways or areas for them to build tracks, these are actual pieces of land. So they've got thousands of acres of land across the state. By 1870, as you can see, the Southern Pacific will reach Los Angeles, and by the mid-1870s, they will own 85% of the rails in California. They basically have created a monopoly by the 1870s. They will expand their monopoly into other parts of the country, um, and I'll show you a map in a minute, including parts of the Northwest and down through the Southwest and over to New Orleans. So um, that eventually they will form what is called the Southern Pacific Holding Company. Um, and the holding company was basically formed to reduce competition so that it could absorb other competitors. Um, this is the type of horizontal integration that people like uh, John D. Rockefeller were using to consolidate his standard oil company. This is a very similar kind of um, strategy being done with the Southern Pacific Railroad. And they're basically trying to reduce, so by the time, reduce competition. So by the time we get to 1886, this company has become the most powerful company in the um, state of California and certainly the most powerful transportation network um, throughout not just California, but along the West Coast and throughout the southwestern part of the United States. They will ultimately have, by the time we get to 1886, where they have formed this holding company, they will have 9,000 miles of railway and 16,000 miles of waterway with their shipping lines. So shipping lines were really integral in, the, in their um, company as well because of course you can move stuff across land but then also you want to be able to move goods across the sea get goods um, bring them back from other places load them onto your railways and then distribute them throughout the country so if we look at a map of uh, the southern pacific lines we can see that it is quite extensive, of course, all throughout California, but up to Oregon, out to Utah, that's a remnant of the original transcontinental line, across the southwest uh, to Phoenix, and um, you have parts of Texas as well, um, and then all the way up to St. Louis, and then down to New Orleans, where there was other ports which would carry goods across the Gulf of Mexico out into the Atlantic. So a very substantial um, impact on transportation. The Southern Pacific was also responsible for promoting tourism in California. In fact, you could almost argue that the Southern Pacific in many ways kind of built the image of California as a vacation destination, as a place to come and get away from colder climates. Um, they oftentimes would have um, advertisements um, over on the East Coast enticing people to come to the warmer climate during the uh, winter months. And many of these people who came to California for vacation decided that they wanted to move to California. So it turns out that not only is the Southern Pacific um, promoting tourism and people visiting the state, but they also sort of in an indirect way created the desire to live here. So as um, you know, once the state is connected by these railway systems, the population is going to increase as well. Uh, one of the interesting things um, about the Southern Pacific Railroad Company is the fact that they founded Sunset Magazine um, in 1898. And this, of course, was a way to kind of boost um, the image of California and the California lifestyle. So very interesting the way that um, California and the image of California has been crafted um, over its history.
So, so many things can be said about the railroads in terms of its impact on the state. Um, obviously, it's going to connect the state in a way that it had never been connected before. Um, California did begin to feel more a part of the United States after the Civil War, but once the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, it really solidified California's connection with the rest of the country. California can now also ship refrigerated goods out of the state. Once refrigerated cars were built, they can ship goods out of the state and agricultural goods, um, meats, um, things that California was known for can now be brought to other parts of the country. Um, California also becomes a tourist destination as a result of the building of the railroad. Um, it becomes a place where people want to come and live and as a result of the railroad and people uh, visiting. So it really does fundamentally transform the state. It also really changes um, politics in the state because politics for so long becomes part of uh, the, the, the railroad and the railroad companies really dominate California politics um, all the way through the duration of the 19th century at the state level. And so they are very uh, powerful presence. And we will talk more about the railroads and how they impact politics as we get into other chapters. Uh, but for now, the main thing is the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, the completion of it in 1869, and its impact and importance on the state. It also has a major impact here locally. Um, in 1876, the railroad, the Southern Transcontinental Railroad, will be built through the Coachella Valley. Um, the first um, line of it is built from Los Angeles to Indio, and that's 1876. In 1884, a big salt company opens up um, in uh, Indio, outside of Indio, down towards the Salton Sea of course, for harvesting salt, but this is a big production and it brings a lot of people. And so you're gonna to start to see a community forming in Indio as a result of this salt company. In 1885, you've got the first store that opens up in Indio to help service that small community, small and growing community. Also in 1885, you have McCallum who comes to uh, Palm Springs because of his um, sick son. Um, he's trying to find relief from his uh, tuberculosis and his cough, and he's heard that dry environments are good for that, so he travels to Palm Springs and sets up a, a home here, and he becomes the first non-Indian resident of Palm Springs um, in 1885. And then in 1890, um, the Uni United States Department of Agriculture decides to um, uh, experiment with growing dates um, in the uh, Coachella Valley, and it turns out to be a very successful experiment. And so date plantations will open up here. And um, dates are, this is the only place in the United States where dates can grow. Um, the dates, of course, are native to uh, the Middle East. And so this created a whole um, industry here in the United States for dates and date growing. So the railroad is really responsible for also bringing people to the valley um, and creating the communities along the rail railway lines. Okay, so changing gears a little bit here, we are going to return to politics and talk about the Constitution of 1879. The Constitutional Convention of 1879. So there was a lot of issues at stake at this convention. Um, there was a lot of political discontent as the state began to grow. One of the biggest issues was the inequitable tax system. And this had to do with the fact that land was taxed um, pretty heavily in California. This goes back to the big ranchos. You remember back to when the Californios owned those big ranchos, these biggest states. And the state legislature 
when it first established its constitution, decided to tax uh, land instead of wealth. Um, and this was a kind of an, um, as a punishment for the, to the Californios who of course owned the big ranchos and estates, but it was also to protect the people who were mining and gaining these big vast fortunes through mining. So that was the first issue at hand. The second issue was this power that the railroad and the banking industry had um, in the state. They had a representation um, in the state legislature. They had a lot of power. They were able to make laws. They didn't have any kind of um, check system in place to kind of check the power of these big railroad companies and these big banks. Um, and then finally, uh, the other issue was this growing racial prejudice against the Chinese population, which we will talk about more in the next slide. Um, but there was a growing sort of anti-Chinese sentiment that was um, emerging as a result of financial strains um, in the country in the 1870s. So this constitutional convention will have 152 delegates, which is like three times as much as the 1849 California Constitutional Convention. And this was a much less diverse group. Um, it was mainly, it was made up um, of Americans who had an interest in seeing some of these um, political changes taking place. So what is the result of this very contentious Constitutional Convention of 1879? Well, first and foremost, there was a big debate within the convention of whether or not to grant women's suffrage here in the state, the right of women to vote. This was something that was being debated amongst the Western states and um, California, unfortunately, will turn down um, the right of women to vote in the 1879 Constitutional Convention. They will be beat out by Wyoming, which will be the first state to allow women to vote in 1890. So they missed an opportunity there to be the first state in the nation. So that was shot down, although there were a lot of uh, suffragettes who really uh, petitioned hard to see that pass. The other major uh, thing that happens at the Constitutional Convention of 1879 is that the law is repealed that requires that all official documents in California be written in both Spanish and English. So the original Constitutional Convention 1849 said that all official documents within the state had to be bilingual. Um, that changes in 1879 moving forward. And then to address some of the main issues, some of the primary issues that um, the Constitutional Convention was called for, a state board of uh, tax equalization was established to try to oversee fair and efficient tax collection. Um, and again, uh, this was an inadequate system and it didn't really make everybody happy, but it was something that um, was a step in the right direction in terms of fair tax collect collection moving forward. And then um, there was also a commission put in place to oversee the railroads, particularly the rail rates, railroad rate rates um, that were very inconsistent throughout the state and really throughout the country. There was a serious issue with railroads price gouging and not really having any kind of check um, regulation. And so there was a commission established to try to oversee the railroads. This commission was very ineffective moving forward because the railroads had so much uh, political power. Um, and then finally, and also sort of sadly, um, the uh, Constitution of 1879 was extremely racist against the Chinese population of the state. Um, it made it illegal for corporations to hire Chinese workers. Um, it essentially made it legal to discriminate against the Chinese. It gave, it reiterated the fact that the Chinese would have uh, no legal rights, no legal recourse. Um, the quote is aliens, that it defined the um, Chinese as aliens who are or may be dangerous or detrimental. Um, and 
they uh, again corporations were um, banned from uh, in, prohibited from employing the Chinese except in punishment for a crime um, cities were permitted to restrict Chinese to prescribe districts as well as to disallow their residents entirely um, and so it was a a real sort of poke at the Chinese in 1879 and it really is a glimpse of things to come when it comes to anti-Chinese legislation at a federal level. So the Constitution of 1879 didn't really make anybody happy. Um, there were people on both sides that were unhappy with the final result, but it ended up really being sort of a compromise moving forward. Um, but when you look at some of the provisions and some of the things, particularly the rejection of women's suffrage, um, the repeal of the law requiring all official documents to be written in Spanish and English, and the anti-Chinese um, clauses written into the Constitution, um, it really does um, sort of seem like a step backwards. It does, however, form the basis of the modern Constitution in the state of California, although it has been amended hundreds of times um, since 1879. Okay, so let's move on now to talk about this anti-Chinese movement um, that we see emerging throughout the country in the 1870s. This is really in many ways a direct result of the depression of the 1870s, uh, which really peaked in 1873, but lasted throughout the entire decade, where we see a decline in um, employment uh, throughout the country. We see um, companies and uh, corporations uh, lowering the wages of workers. We see widespread labor demonstrations throughout the company, country. And there was a serious need to find a scapegoat for these, these things that were happening. And the scapegoat uh, for many, particularly in the railroad industry, were the Chinese and the Chinese workers. So the Chinese continued to um, immigrate to California. Um, in 1876 alone, 22,000 Chinese laborers, laborers came to San Francisco. And this was seen as a threat to the white unemployed population of the state. It was seen so much as a threat that eventually there will be a um, political movement that will be created in order to try to stop um, the Chinese from immigrating. And this political movement will be led by a man, man by the name of Dennis Kearney, and he will form the Working Man's Party, organized in 1877. And they had a lot of platforms. They had a lot of part to their platform, including an eight-hour workday, the direct election of senators, compulsory education, a lot of actually pretty progressive legislation. But their main drawback was that they were very prejudiced against the Chinese, who they saw as being people who were a threat to their working, um, be, to them getting jobs because the Chinese were willing to work for less and because they were hard workers, they were desirable workers. So the Working Man's Party goes to work trying to lobby the Congress, lobby the state legislature to restrict um, the Chinese. Um, an example of this really nasty Chinese, um, anti-Chinese movement is a riot that happens in Los Angeles in October of uh, 1871. Um, and this was basically, um, the riot broke out as a competition. There was a competition for jobs, or at least a, um, it was a perceived competition for jobs. And eventually a white man was killed and um, the Chinese were blamed for his death. And there was a big posse sent out of Anglos and Hispanics um, to basically round up a bunch of Chinese. And 
they did round up between um, 19 and 21 Chinese and many of these victims of this vigilante justice were lynched. This was the bloodiest uh, massacre in the state's history in terms of the anti-Chinese movement. Ultimately, through the um, power and the um, persuasion of the Working Man's Party, the U.S. Congress will pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Originally, it was set as a temporary law only to last 10 years, but it was later extended and then made permanent in 1902. It will not be repealed until 1943. Basically, what it does is it forbids Chinese people from immigrating into the United States. Um, it, it, uh, it did have some exceptions. The exceptions were if you were a student, if you were a teacher, a merchant, or you had a direct member of your family in the U.S., or if you were a temporary traveler, you could still come to the U.S., but it greatly limited the amount of Chinese people that could come into um, the United States. Notice here that there is no Chinese laborers specifically that are allowed to come in, and that was the majority of the population that was coming to the United States where this was this working labor force. So as a result of the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the population of Chinese in the United States will drop from a high of 136,000 in 1883 to 46,000 in 1900. The Chinese Exclusion Act is important because not only is it, is it the first major immigration restriction act, but it is also the only immigration law to single out a specific ethnicity. So in that way, it was particularly cruel. And um, you can really see sort of the depth of the um, discrimination against Chinese people specifically here um, in this act. And it really all spawns from the financial crisis and the need for people to have a scapegoat. So despite the fact that the Chinese made such an important impact, um, both in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, in agriculture, in merchant businesses, in building up cities in, um, throughout the state, um, unfortunately, in the, in the end, um, they are going to be discriminated against and the Chinese Exclusion Act will go into law in 1882. So that concludes the material from chapter six. If you have any questions, please zoom in to office hours and I will be posting some material from chapter seven uh, later this week so that we can get through both of these chapters. All right, have a good one. See you later.